welcome to the Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast. 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 Welcome to the Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast with me, Dr. Janine Anderson. Heads up, this show may contain adult language and may mention specific foods. If you find either of those to be too triggering, I trust you to take care of yourself and do what you need to do. This podcast is sponsored by Ipono Maui and ED Care. Ipono Maui is led by internationally renowned expert on eating disorders, Dr. Anita Johnston. Located in a home-like oceanfront facility in beautiful Maui, Hawaii, Ipono offers residential, partial hospitalization, and intensive outpatient treatment for eating disorders. Visit iponomaui.com, spelled A-I-P-O-N-O-M-A-U-I, to learn more. ED Care has provided PHP, IOP, and outpatient treatment for all genders 18 and over since 2001. CAMSA, which stands for Connection, Acceptance, Mindfulness, Sense of Self, and Action, is ED Care's mindfulness-based treatment approach and is incorporated into each individualized treatment plan. Facilities are located in Denver, Colorado Springs, and Kansas City, and all treatment is supported by master's level clinicians or higher. ED Care offers four specialty tracks for binge eating disorder, elite athletes, substance use, and trauma. And the Connections House and affordable, supportive housing component adds an extra layer of supervised support. Visit eatingdisorder.care or call 866-771-0861. Hi, friends. Welcome back for the second episode of Season 4 of the Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast. This episode, one of our favorites, Dr. Anita Johnston, joins us to talk about meaning in recovery, recovery as a path to higher consciousness, and the soul's journey. Really, really interesting stuff. I just wanted to put out a quick little plug that my book is going to be released on Amazon February 27th, 2018. It's called Recover Your Perspective. There will be a link to that in the show notes, if possible, at the time of this recording. If not, just go ahead and type in my name or the title of the book and you will easily find it on there. Dr. Anita Johnston, PhD, CEDS, is author of Eating in the Light of the Moon, is a licensed psychologist, certified eating disorders specialist, speaker, and consultant. With over 30 years of clinical experience, she is a leader in the field of eating disorder treatment. She is the director and founder of Ipono Eating Disorder Programs and Ipono Residential Programs in Maui. She is the creator of Light of the Moon Cafe, an interactive e-course and online support circle for women with eating disorders. You can find her at www.dranitajohnston.com or at www.lightofthemooncafe.com. Anita also wanted to let you all know that she is offering a discounted code for her upcoming Light of the Moon Cafe round, and that is the e-course where she's teaching it live and everybody is going through the course at the same time together. So when you take that course, you go through all the material with your cohort members and also with Anita on there, and she's very interactive. You have access to her helping you, and you have lifetime membership in the online support circle, which is like a really great for the members there. When you go through it together with everybody, In this next round, it's going to overlap a little bit with this season of the podcast, but she wanted to offer you all the discount code, and I'll update you as those come out in general anyway. So there will be a link to that discount code and link to information about the online e-course with Anita in the show notes as usual. I would really recommend this, especially for people living in areas where eating disorder treatment resources are very limited. I get a lot of emails from all across the globe with people telling me there's just nothing in our area, and this is an excellent way for you to engage in some good recovery-oriented material, be with other people who are recovery-minded, and then to get direct access to somebody who's an expert in the field. Now to the interview. Dr. Johnston, thanks for being here today. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to have you. We're actually recording live from Colorado Therapy and Assessment (laughs) Center, so it's really nice to have you in person. Topic for today is recovery as a path to higher consciousness, which is a big, big topic. So I guess first I wanted to talk a little bit about how 
the process of doing recovery can really suck and just talk about the pain that's involved. I don't want anybody to hear this and think we're saying recovery is always delightful and it's all roses and rainbows and that sort of thing. Well, it's definitely not a day at the beach. (laughs) (laughs) And it requires a lot of hard work, sometimes some pain that is essential in any kind of healing. That has to be acknowledged. But I think most people are familiar with the pain of the recovery process and the difficulty and the fear and the shame and all of that that comes up. But a lot of people are not aware that there's a great deal of joy in the process. And I think if we can't let people know that, not just that they're headed towards a life beyond their wildest dreams, and I see that uh, it's important that people get a glimpse of that, but they don't have to wait. You don't have to wait to be fully, completely recovered in order to have a life that has joy and satisfaction that along the way, they are what we psychologists call these aha moments Mm -hmm. that we live for, actually, because that is not simply what makes the pain of recovery bearable, but it's what gives us the hope that's required for healing. Mm. And so, and it helps us zoom out, taking that lens, because with recovery, a lot of times you have to zoom in and really get down to the nitty gritty of what you're doing, what the behaviors are, how come you're doing them, what's triggering them. And so there is that kind of sometimes a bit of a laser focus, but then you also have to zoom out to get the bigger picture, the wider, more expansive picture that lets you know why bother in the first place, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, if this is such hard work and it's so scary and so painful, why am I doing this in the first place? And if there wasn't a good reason for doing it, then I think we're asking a lot of people. It's true. What would you say to somebody who's on the outs with hope, that hope is their biggest struggle right now to believe that it could even be possible for them to recover? Mm, Good question, because it's that feeling of hopelessness that kind of sucks the life out of us, Um, that feeling of despair. And it typically, it comes from a sense that I'm not good enough. I can't do this. And that means there's something fundamentally wrong with me. I am broken to such a degree that I can't be fixed. And every time I try to fix myself, you know, things get worse. And I think what helps is to shift the perception that perhaps your being in pain means that you're on a path to healing, not that you are broken. And so a lot of times shifting perception is what's required to find that hope, to entertain some other possibilities of why you might be experiencing an eating disorder a dreadful eating disorder in the first place. And that's a tough one to come to because, and again, I think to get there, you've got to zoom way out. (laughs) You have to go to the way bigger perspective, what I call the soul's perspective. Tell us about that. Well, I think our consciousness operates at multiple levels and there is the most basic level that most of us hang out in, which is, you know, we're in these bodies and we're schlepping them around from place to place. (laughs) And we got these thoughts that follow us along. And we got these feelings that seem to come up out of nowhere sometimes. You know, we're at this level of understanding things as best we can. In some spiritual traditions, they call that the ego level of consciousness, where you're really attached to things being about you. And when children first develop an ego, so it's not like an ego is a bad thing. It's like without an ego, you can't drive a car. You are not going to know what kind of dog food to get at the grocery. But this level of consciousness is very useful in day-to-day life. Mm, Not so much when it comes to trying to understand suffering and hardship and the difficulties we human beings encounter That's the part. And when we try to use that level of understanding to figure out why someone has an eating disorder, we're going to fail miserably, I think, because that faculty is not designed for that job. 
in some spiritual traditions, they say, you know, you need to get rid of the ego. And, and that would frankly be a disaster because we have to get along on this planet somehow and figure stuff out. So it's valuable, but it's not so valuable, like I said, when it comes to understanding what's really going on in terms of big picture. And I think that's where the soul level of consciousness is required. You know, what are we doing here in the first place? <laughs> you mean on Earth? <laughs> on Earth, <laughs> right? Like, where did we come from? And gee, why did we get these parents? And why was I born with into this socioeconomic group? Or why do I have this ethnicity? Or you know, those are giant questions. But I don't think that the question about the eating disorder is so far removed from that either, that somewhere along the line, we don't create the eating disorder the way we would, I don't know, write a book. I mean, it's not really, it's not something we consciously ever set out to do. And yet we're experiencing it. And so if you ask the question, why me? That's at the ego level of trying to understand things. But if you ask it with a certain amount of curiosity and wonder, huh, I wonder why me? I wonder what this is about. It can take you to a really different place. It can take you to a place of understanding the difference between fate and destiny, for example. And when you can understand those things, it can be very freeing. And if you consider what eating disorder recovery is about, it's about freedom. Ultimately, that's where you're headed, free to be your authentic self, free to be comfortable in your own skin, free to, you know, appreciate and accept what life has to offer and free to respond to some of the stuff that life does send up that we don't really like in ways that are not harmful to us or others. So ultimately, from that perspective, you can find freedom. And I happen to believe that the eating disorder recovery path is one. There are many, but it's one that can take you to that place, to that mm. soul's perspective. How does that work? <laughs> how, do, how does it work? I'm just giving you all the easy questions today. <laughs> I, I don't know how it works, but I, I have a way of conceptualizing it that comes from Michael Mead's work. And uh, he's an amazing uh, mythologist and storyteller. And one of the things he talks about is what all the great myths have to tell us, that there's a theme to what they communicate to us about how to be a human being mm -hmm. and how to be on this planet with all the challenges that we get presented by. And he talks about the concepts of fate and destiny. Tell us about those. So fate is all those things that life gave you that you didn't ask for, right? Okay, here's your parents, here's your ethnicity, here's your socioeconomic group, this is the part of the world in which you're born, here's your body type, here's the car accident you, you were in, here's that childhood illness, and here's your eating disorder. It's like the stuff that life delivers up and we didn't ask for it. That's your fate. Destiny is something different. Destiny is where we are destined to go in life and who we are destined to become. And they say in ancient myths, in a lot of traditional cultures, they have a similar idea that we are all born with our destiny deep inside of ourselves. And the task then becomes one of uh, living your destiny and discovering your destiny. Fate Fate's a lot easier to see, right? You're, I can think, okay, yeah. this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. But when we're looking at the story of our lives, typically what happens is we begin with, okay, so we're this little baby here. It's like any story, things go wrong. Stuff happens. It wouldn't be much of a story if it didn't, right? right. I mean, who is interested in the story that says, oh, well, she was born and, and all these wonderful things happened and nothing ever went wrong and then she died. It's like, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's not much of a story. It's boring. Yeah. And, and so is the case for all of us. So we're born and then we're fated with certain things. And these are the things that you're not going to be able to change, right? But what you can do is you can change your perspective about them. But the stuff happens, car accidents, hurricanes, abuse, you know, horrible things sometimes, illnesses. Um, but then how do we manage 
And here's what the ancient myths have to tell all of us about what it means to be human, is that if you do not face your fate, you cannot live your destiny. And this is a big deal, because if you consider your destiny is the gift you were born with and the gift you have come to give. So in some Native American traditions, they call that the medicine that you were born with. Most ancient cultures understand that each soul on this planet has a gift that is as unique as its thumbprint. But it's not just your gift to hoard and go, ha, 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 I got this and you didn't. <laughs> no, it's also the gift you've come to give. And that is your destiny. So there's this tribe, the Appendary tribe, and they talk about being born with what they call the wise word. And it's not a word like we think of a word and language, but it's this gift, your own particular genius, your own particular medicine that you're born with that's unique to you. So it's so unique that what that means is, for example, with my gift that I've come with and come to give, there'll never be another Anita on the planet like me. Some people would say, thank goodness, but uh, there never will. No one would um, say that. <laughs> and um, there never has been and never will be. So that if I don't give the gift I have been born to give, something is lost. And the same for you. There's never been another Janine like you and never will be another that will have this particular unique gift. And that's same for every single one of your listeners. Nobody is born without a gift they've come to give. However, <laughs> here's where the story gets interesting. According to the Appendary tribe, um, they believe you're born with your wise word, but you're also born with the cross wise word, that which sits across your wise word. That is what we would typically call fate. Okay. Mm. So here's the irony of it. You've got this gorgeous gift your gold. It's your, the, in Jungian traditions, we call it your inner gold. But sitting on top of it is your fate. All that stuff that happens to you that is blocking your gift from coming through, but it's right there buried beneath it. So like in Hawaii, people might take a metal detector and they go to the beach and they're going along, going along with this metal. All of a sudden, zzz, dig there. That's where the treasure is. Mm -hmm. So what the ancient myths are trying to tell us is that that which you've been fated with, buried there, right beneath that place, is your gift, is your destiny, who you are destined to become and where you're destined to go in life. So for me, that's a pretty powerful concept to work with an eating disorder, mm -hmm. right? Typically, and this is not always the case, but often someone's gift of being super sensitive, very compassionate person, that has this gift to really receive all of that life has to give and give the beauty of life, often what happens is that gets blocked by their fate of having an eating disorder. Mm. But the beauty of that is if they face their fate, if they go into treatment, if they say, all right, I don't like this, it really sucks having an eating disorder, but I'm going to face it. I'm not going to pretend I don't. I'm not going to deny it. I'm going to face it. What happens as a result is extraordinary. Um, and, you know, I've been doing this for 35 years now, so I get to see how extraordinary it is. So I've seen hundreds and I know of thousands who have struggled with an eating disorder, have done the hard work to face their fate and recover, and the gifts that they bring to the world are gorgeous. They're extraordinary. You should know, right? <laughs> <laughs> the world is a better place because of that. Mm -hmm. The world is a better place for those that can summon the courage. It's scary. No question about it. It's hard work and requires a certain amount of fortitude. But I believe in every fiber of my being that those people who have struggled with eating disorders, done the hard work for recovery, they're the people the world has been waiting for. I mean, seriously, look at our world right now. <laughs> look carefully because it's, 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 it could hurt, you know, to look. But when you look at where the healing balm comes from, 
You look at those people that somehow can find the right words, that somehow can, you know, keep their heart open in the midst of horrible tragedies or terrible discrimination and abuse. Wow, you can feel the healing that's in that. Mm -hmm. And so these are people that have, that have faced their fate and then have delivered up. We get to benefit as a part of their destiny. Now, I'm not just talking about, you know, people that are out there and that are doing good in the community and doing these, these incredible deeds and that are these big public figures, but it happens on smaller, personal, private, scale as well, but no less magnificent. Mm. Um, What's an example? Okay, I'm going to tell you a really, uh, a real personal example. I'm going to tell you about one of my sisters. And, you know, if I cry while I tell the story, that's just because... You know, it, there is crying on this podcast. Okay, it happens. It, it touches my heart, and I like to keep my heart open. So I have a sister two years older than I, brilliant, like genius. We'd come home from school and have to, there were seven of us kids, so we had to put our report cards on the table. And she always had straight A's and she was valedictorian. But she and I fought all the time because we had very different personalities. And I was envious of her, you know, her intellectual faculties that she just would breeze through school. I struggled with some things that I still struggle with, <laughs> like numbers and things like that. But that's part of my fate. Anyhow, <laughs> she was faded with this really keen mind, but she wasn't interested in using it. So she did not want, she didn't want to go to college. She didn't want fame. She didn't want fortune. She didn't want children. She, I mean, the stuff that I, you know, thought, okay, I got to work really hard to get all this stuff. She didn't want any of that. All she ever wanted was to be a wife. And I, as a as a teenager, I just thought that that was just ridiculous. Someone with all that she had, right? So we fought a lot because I was judgmental and she was judgmental of me. But anyhow, so what happened is that she dropped out of college and she married her uh, childhood uh, sweetheart. And when they were getting ready to go on their honeymoon, they had a horrible car accident and she had severe, severe brain damage to the point where she couldn't do anything but create a system for a couple of years where she would raise her eyebrows once for yes and twice for no. I said, mm -hmm. okay, we're going to figure this out. We're going to do this. It was heartbreaking. She lost her husband. They divorced. He couldn't handle. Um, it was tragic all the way around. The one thing that she had wanted now was gone. And what was she going to do? So over the years, she was able to speak. She had to relearn everything, everything. She had to learn how to swallow again. Oh my gosh. Um, and so, but eventually after a couple of years, she was able to speak, but it sounded like somebody who's had a really bad stroke. So most people couldn't understand her, but I could understand her. But then came time for me to go away. I went, we were living on Guam at the time and I went to graduate school on the mainland in California. And while I was there, she was stayed with my parents and they were caring for her. But while I was there, a big typhoon hit the island. Mm. And my parents contacted me and said, look, we've lost the roof over her room. We're not going to have power and water for months. Can you take her? And I went, well, yeah, you know, send her my way. So here we have a twist of fate, right? Yeah. Another twist of fate. So she comes to be with me. I'm in graduate school. It was really hard. But eventually, um, I found a place for her to stay where there, she was in her, she was 22 years old. So there was a place that had young people who had had similar mishaps that were quadriplegic or paraplegic, and they could live in this little enclave. So I managed to get her in there, and she met this man who was also severely disabled. Long story short, they got together, and she spent the rest of her life with him until the day she died. And so for 40 years, she was confined to a wheelchair. And she lived with this man. I mean, when I say lived with him, they lived in this apartment. They didn't leave much other than to go maybe a doctor's appointment. Now, on the surface of it, at the ego level of understanding, this is a horrible tragedy. And it's true. It's a, it was a horrible tragedy. But at the soul level, did she live her destiny? Mm -hmm. She she lived her destiny. You know, she got what she wanted, which the one thing she wanted was an intimate relationship with a man and she got it. So I tell you this story because it shows you the different levels of right. consciousness. 
Um, and I'm not saying this was an easy journey for her any more than it's an easy journey to struggle with and recover from an eating disorder, but it gives you a different perspective. And sometimes when you're in the middle of the dreck of what it takes to recover, having a different perspective can really help, at least if it can give you a glimpse, if it can give you hope, then you've got some energy to, that kind of keeps you going, you know, mm-hmm. keeps you going on. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering what sorts of things can help to keep that higher perspective, that higher consciousness about it when you are really feeling the suffering of whatever yeah. fate is bringing you. Yeah. I think one of the things that helps me is to appreciate that we get to write the end of our story. We're in charge of this. Okay. So if you think of your life as a three act play, act one, um, the script's been written. (laughs) The characters have been cast. These are your parents. Here's your ethnicity. Here's your socioeconomic. I mean, all of that is laid out and here we go. Roll them. Act one. And a lot of difficult stuff can happen in act one. Here's the fate stuff that we would never choose. Stuff that really sucks. And here's the script and we're just kind of going along. Act two Um, there's a little room for improvisation. There's a little room to ad lib, but still mm, that script is pretty much, you know, written. People come and go. The characters might, some may leave and some new ones come in, but basically you're still going along the script. Act three, that's yours to write. You get to write the script for act three. And what that means is you can't go back and say, oh, that didn't happen in act one, or that really didn't happen in act two. But you can change the meaning of that Mm. because you get to write this part of your story. So you get to decide, all right, is my story going to be a tragedy? Her life sucked when she was born and horrible things happened and it sucked when she died. Or is it going to be a transformational tale where this stuff happened and as a result, your consciousness was transformed in ways that you could never have imagined otherwise? Or is it going to be an inspirational tale? These people, these that we look towards, these heroes in our lives, whether they're family members or big public figures that inspire us. Is that what your story is? Is it going to be irony? You know, it's like, ha, who would have thought this and this (laughs) happened? And then look where we are now. You get to decide that. And so I think one of the ways that one of the helpful reminders, I do this myself when I'm in like, you know, middle of some difficult stuff is say, hey, the story's not over. What kind of story is this going to be? Even if you cannot change the external events, you can absolutely change the meaning you give to those events. Mm -hmm. And therein lies the hope and therein lies the freedom. I was first introduced to this concept when I was a young graduate student and I walked into this class and there's a little old man and it was one of my first graduate classes and he's in front of the room talking in a very thick accent. And I knew he was speaking English, but it was really hard for me to understand him. So I had to really, really concentrate and listen to every word he said. And thank goodness I did because that man was Victor Frankl. And, oh my God. And he wrote Man's Search for Meaning. Mm-hmm. And Which uh, everybody should go read. Everybody. Everybody, everybody needs everybody. to read that. <laughs> yes. Yep. And he created logotherapy. And his story, for those uh, of your listeners that don't know, he was a psychiatrist that was in the Nazi prison camps during World War II. And he developed this concept because he observed that people could be stripped of everything and all the horrific things of mankind's inhumanity to mankind. And yet what he discovered is that what made all the difference for anyone there was the meaning they gave to their experience. And that's where their freedom was. So out of very early in my career, I was impacted by that idea that there's deep meaning. And if you can get to the the depths of the meaning, that's where the freedom lies. And in a way, that's the fate and destiny thing, right? If you can understand that, okay, so the fate is here, but buried beneath it, there's something much deeper, something much more precious than you can even imagine. And then you got to get there by by sometimes by simply entertaining the idea and asking the question, what's this about? Mm -hmm. I wonder where this is leading me. Mm -hmm. How would I like to use this horrible experience to have a better life, Mm -hmm. to help somebody else have a better life? And that's liberating. 
Yeah. We've talked about that on the podcast that Mm -hmm. I think the first step is willingness. And if you're Mm -hmm. not willing, willing to be willing one day, maybe. Yeah. 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 Um, So, so backing up and even entertaining the idea that Mm -hmm. there could be a greater meaning to all these experiences is awesome. It is. If you think of eating disorder recovery as a path to higher consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. What if you happen to be and I'm joking, I'm not trying to make light of this, but I I also am, Uh, given this experience where you have all kinds of signals to let you know when you're veering off your path. Some people call those signals symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. But what if you could look at that and every one of your eating disorder behaviors, for example, as like a little red light that goes on to let you know, no, 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 not this way, this way, this way. It's, It's kind of showing you the way out by showing you where not to go. Right. Right. And I love what you said about being able to make your own meaning. I mean, Frankel said that. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) But I I really like that approach because I know people have mixed feelings and and I have mixed feelings about that idea that everything happens to us for a reason. And I think that that can be heard as incredibly invalidating, but I do agree. We can make whatever meaning we want from experiences. Yeah. There's a triteness to everything happens for a reason, you know, and unfortunately, because then people say it when they don't know what else to say. Right. Mm -hmm. But we give the meaning to our lives anyhow, right? You can't help yourself. You are going to give it meaning. But what most people don't realize is there is an element of choice in the meaning that you give. In fact, that's typically the only place you have any choice, right? We can't always choose what happens, but we do have choice in the meaning we give to it. And to just entertain that idea that there might be another perception that is much more expansive, that willingness that you mentioned to entertain the idea there might be another way to look at this. And through that perception, we can be free. But we give it meaning whether we want to or not. Right. And so (laughs) if you're really stuck, I think the meaning that a lot of us wind up giving to those experiences are, this sucks, life is suffering. And Mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily argue with that, Mm -hmm. but I Mm -hmm. would say maybe we also need to have the other side of it as well. Yeah. It's true that it sucks. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about denial here to say, oh, everything's fine. and Oh, everything happens for a reason. That's not what we're talking about here. It's more inclusive. It sucks. And there's more to the story here. And I think that's the expansion that I'm talking about that takes you to a higher level that's way, way, way more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Then you get to the part of yourself that is way more inclusive. And I call that the soul self. That is much more than your thoughts and your feelings and your body and much more even than the sum of all of those. There's an aspect of ourselves that's so much bigger than all of that. And when you can experience that, and we, we don't get to all the time, we just get glimpses of it. But the feeling of connecting with that aspect of your being is um, healing, extraordinary yeah. healing. What are some signs that somebody, as they're moving forward in their recovery, is starting to connect with their soul self mm-hmm. and their destiny? Ah, good question. One of the ways I like to think about it is, Well, this shows you how old I am, but um, (laughs) there used to be this show called The Gong Show and people would go up and it was like a horrible talent contest. And if if someone was really bad, they'd get gonged and there'd there'd be this dong sound. (laughs) And I think of it as the opposite of that. Okay. The opposite of that is when you have something that goes ding, 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 like in your cells. So there are things that when I think about doing them, like for example, when I think about speaking without knowing what I'm going to say. (laughs) like what we're doing right now. When I think about it ahead of time, I kind of have this kind of uh, a little bit of a heavy feeling like, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? I don't know anything. But when I'm doing it, I feel this enlivening, uh, this ding, 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 ding. And so that's a clue for me that whether I want it or not, this is a part of my destiny. And it took me a while to come to that. I fought it and fought it and fought it. I did not want to do anything in the public eye. And yet... Well, too I, bad. It's yeah, destiny, exactly. Right. <laughs> right. Too bad. Because when I would do it, it would feel so right. And mm-hmm. so I think that's it. It's like, you know, it's your destiny because even if it doesn't make sense, it feels right. There isn't this like heaviness. There isn't this constriction that can come when you think about doing it. <laughs> but I'm talking about just being in it and doing it. 
the image I, I like to think of also is, you know, those connect the dot pictures. Yep. You don't know in the beginning what that picture is going to look like, but you know, when you made a right connection, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, we're here. And now we're here. And now we're here. Oh, I see this. So that's kind of how, you know, I think what happens in treatment, it's like you might go kicking and screaming because the thought of it and sometimes parts of the experience of it feel so dreadful, but it's those moments, those moments of ding, ding, ding. Oh, oh, I never thought of it this way or, oh, I get it. It's so exhilarating and so exciting because it's feedback from your soul self saying, yeah, girl, you're on your path of destiny. <laughs> Stay the course. I like that. And then and it's just a glimpse. Sometimes it only is just like a, the tiniest moment and then it's gone. And you're going, oh, mm-hmm. we're back in the this sucks level of awareness that is very real. And I wish I knew why. <laughs> I don't know why we have to, but I know we do. Um, and again, if you can shift even your concept around pain, whether it's physical or emotional pain, I, I think of something the Dalai Lama says. And he says that what we call our pain is really not our pain, that it belongs to the whole of humanity. And that when you step into the river of pain and feel it, you are connected to the whole of humanity. Now, for me, there's something healing about that. That tells me that I'm not really alone in my pain. Um, Your pain may be different from my pain, but we both know pain. Right. Um, and so there is some something to that feeling of connectedness, which that's the element of higher consciousness that, you know, that the mystics will talk about the oneness. They're talking about that feeling of connectedness. And sometimes we do get it through pain. Right. Sorry to say. Right. And it's unavoidable. It, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Buddha said pain in life is inevitable. Suffering is optional. Now, what's meant by that is we're we're back to the meaning. You see, you will continue to suffer from your pain unless you give it a different meaning, Mm -hmm. which is hard to do when you're in it. But we're it's we're putting it out there as an option for you in case you'd like to consider it. Yeah, it's really really hard. Yeah, but so worth it. Mm -hmm. So so worth the effort to even have a smidgen of a moment of feeling that connectedness Mm -hmm. with yourself, with humanity, with nature, with the world, because I think that's where healing comes from. Mm -hmm. The connection, Mm -hmm. the connectedness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I think the, when you were talking about listening to destiny and signs that you're in tune with your destiny, mm-hmm. that it can be really tiny things too. Like I'm thinking oh, of tiny. a client who is really excited because she potentially wanted to make friends with somebody and she's mm-hmm. not over the moon thinking about this all the time, mm-hmm. but there was something mm-hmm. that perked up in her and yeah. said, Oh, I might want to do that. Yeah. 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 That's exactly right. It is the tiny things that let you know and then connect you, I think, to your soul self. Mm-hmm. They don't have to be big, grand blowing off the top of your head uh, ecstasies. It's not like that at all, really. Right. Most of the time is just the little, little moments mm-hmm. of peace, of contentment, of joy mm-hmm. that help you, you know, line up. Mm-hmm. Does everyone have a destiny? And is it always something that can be good? Yes. Well, I there think. you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I would have to say, of course. Now, The caveat to that is, it's really easy to see what your fate is. It is really, really hard to find your destiny. It takes a lifetime. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You can tell when you're on the path, but your destiny, we don't know that. And another thing is, it's hard enough for us to know what our destiny is. It's arrogant if we think we know what somebody else's destiny is. So, you know, I was arrogant as a teenager thinking I knew the life my sister should have. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I'm still, you know, seeking out my destiny. So I think destiny is way more elusive. It's part of the bigger mystery. But in my mind, there's no doubt we have one. Mm -hmm. And that it's worth pursuing. Yeah, I'd have to say it is. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again so much for being here with us today and talking about these really wonderful, more mystical sort of aspects of recovery. I think it's easy to get stuck in 
how tough it can be and each meal being a tough and, and that sort of thing. And it's really a gift to have you here to help us zoom out. Or if you're not ready to zoom out, think about zooming out one day <laughs> and trying on a different perspective just to see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you'll be zooming in and zooming out and zooming in and zooming out. I know, right? <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for joining me for another episode. Let's keep in touch. You can find all the information you need about the podcast at eatingdisorderrecoverypodcast.com including full podcast episodes and links to all of our social media sites. You can join our Facebook group for the podcast by searching Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast on Facebook. This is a closed group for listeners of the podcast looking to connect, share resources, and get involved in a pro-recovery community. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or YouTube. Please leave us a review and let us know how we're doing. Talk to you next time on the Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast.